Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I have so many wires running around me that I think I'm a patient at the hospital right now. Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, I've been to the Holy Land twice in my life, and uh, when you're there, they have many Jesuses running around <laughs> for picture opportunities. And, and I just find it so comical that some people say, hey, there's Jesus, let me take a picture with him. And I say to you, you understand that that's not really Jesus, right? And if that were really Jesus, we probably wouldn't think about taking a picture, not first. Wouldn't be the first thing we did. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. And that's a, a statement that we want to hold on to dearly, even to this day. Because in the language of the New Testament, which, by the way, is known as koine, or common Greek. Uh, Jesus spoke those words. And by the way, I, I'm not a Greek expert or scholar, uh, nor do I pretend to be one on TV. But those people that are experts, they tell us Jesus made that statement in the active indicative tense. And this is why it's so important. The active indicative in Koine Greek represents or denotes an action which is perpetual, never ending, never ceasing. And the action that's in focus in Matthew 16, 18, or that portion of Matthew 16, 18, is Jesus building his church. In other words, Jesus promised us that he would never stop building his church. He has always been building his church from the day of Pentecost until today, April 15, 2018. By the way, did everyone pay their taxes? They're due today. Actually, the, the government gave you a little bit of grace till Tuesday. But in that span of time, Jesus has always built his church. And I say all of that to encourage you who are members of New Testament Baptist Church to encourage you who love New Testament Baptist Church by understanding that Jesus is not done with us. He has a plan. He has a program. And he has a process to build this church. And I know that recently you've heard voices telling you otherwise. You've heard voices uh, of men saying, you know, you guys are dead. There's no way you'll ever recover. But that's the voice of man speaking. That's the flesh. The voice of God tells you, I will build my church. Yeah. You know, <laughs> tragically, almost embarrassingly for Christianity as a whole, there were men of God who stood right where I am standing and told us that we don't have the right DNA. And I want us to understand that at least I speak for myself and I'm sure for the majority. I was born into Christ by the Holy Spirit. He made me born again in Christ Jesus. The DNA that I have spiritually does not come from Ray Cruz. The DNA that we all have in Christ is DNA of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and to say that we don't have the right DNA is to commit a blasphemy against God Almighty. So I want to encourage you today. Jesus said, I will build my church. And I don't know how many of you know this. But the slogan for our church is the church that Jesus built. Since Jesus promised in Matthew 16, 18 to build his church, we have adopted as a slogan the church that Jesus built. And that has several connotations. Number one, that means our focus is not on money. And yes, money is a 
excuse me, money is important to every organism. Money is important to every group of people that meet together for whatever purpose. But money should not be the focus of a church that is built by Jesus. And we understand we all need money. And there's nothing wrong with managing money the right way. The Bible speaks a lot to it. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks more about money than it does about heaven and hell combined. So yes, money is important. But the church that's built by Jesus is not focused on money. It is focused on Jesus himself. And a church that is built by Jesus is not business oriented. And yes, there is an element to every ministry and to every church that is business related, especially a church such as ours where we have two schools that are not only ministries, but they are businesses. And it's important that we get that right and there's nothing wrong with striving to make sure that we get it right from a business perspective. But the church that Jesus builds isn't focused on business. It's focused on being led by the Spirit. It's focused on fulfilling the Word of God. It's focused on Jesus. And lastly, a church that is built by Jesus is not a church that is focused on man. Either the person who's standing where I'm standing right now, or the person who is sitting where you're sitting right now. Because every human so-called leader is flawed. And every human so-called leader is just a sheep, the same way every other Christian is. You'll get sick and tired of hearing me say this, but in the Christian church, there is only one leader. The head of the church is Jesus. He's the commander-in-chief. And all of us, all of us are followers and servants, co-servants of Jesus Christ. And so our focus is not on the ability, the talent, the giftedness of any man. And by the way, there's a lot of churches and a lot of heretical religious organizations that are built on the cult of man. And they number thousands sometimes. Jonestown, remember that? People following men can lead to thousands of people being in one place. But when that's the focus, the end is always disastrous. Jesus needs to be the focus of the church that he builds. Now, the church, according to Ephesians chapter 1, is the body of Christ. And so that we can wrap our heads around what that means, that means the collective group all over the world, all time, in the church era, from Pentecost to today, that is the body of Christ. So the church is both a global slash spiritual organism, and the church is also, interestingly enough, a local slash physical organism. We are global in the sense that the universal church can be found all over the world, from Australia to Asia to the Middle East to the Americas. There's believers all over the world. And we come from all sorts of different backgrounds. We speak all sorts of different languages. All the ethnicities and all the races are represented within the church of Jesus Christ. We are an, a global organism. And we are also a spiritual organism, because we are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit abides in each and every single one of us. And we are linked by the Holy Spirit to all our brothers and sisters all over the world. We are spiritually one in Christ, because we have the Holy Spirit in us. However, the church is local, and not the Spanish L-O-C-O, -O, but local and physical in the sense that we cannot, as instructed by the New Testament, we cannot meet with brothers and sisters in Christ 
from all over the world. We are physically limited in that capacity. And so the instructions of the New Testament is to establish local churches like Ephesus and Corinth and Colossae and Rome and so many other churches that we read about in the New Testament. God has ordained local churches where we can all meet and gather and together serve and worship Jesus. And that is the church that we have here, New Testament Baptist Church. It is a local slice, a little bit, a little piece of the universal church. And in that sense, we can grab and hold on to the promise of Jesus. I will build my church. And I say all of that to introduce the uh, theme of our series, our current series. This is the second me the message on the theme. The church that Jesus built. We are looking at the book of Acts, the first several chapters of the book of Acts, to determine what are the characteristics what are the traits of the first church? Because Jesus promised to build a church. And the first church was built by Jesus. So we who are being built by Jesus, we must look at the characteristics, the traits that are godly in the first church in order to imitate them. In order for us to be able to live out our slogan, our motto. We are the church that Jesus builds. So I draw your attention to the book of Acts, to chapter 2, to verse 40. And there the word of the living God says, And with many other words, he, being Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. A little bit of context. Jesus had risen and he was among the disciples for over 40 days. And in Acts chapter 1, he instructed the disciples to stay in Jerusalem, that they should wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was going to empower them to be his witnesses. In Acts 1, 8, 5, he tells the disciples, John baptized you in water, but soon you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Stay here in Jerusalem and wait. And so they did. They stayed there. They waited. They prayed. They uh, appointed a 12th disciple to replace Jesus. Judas. And in Acts chapter 2, we find them together in one accord, says the Bible, praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit to descend upon them. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them and he baptizes them. And the Bible says they begin to speak in languages not of their own, but human languages that other people could understand. It's a great miracle. It's as if I went to France, and I've never uh, seriously started uh, studied French, but if I go to the Eiffel Tower, and I begin to just preach, and what comes out of my mouth is perfect French, where the, the French people can understand the, the mysteries and the, the marvels of God in their language coming from me. That would be a great miracle. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And with this great miracle, a, a multitude was drawn in. They were curious. The Bible tells us, we studied last week, that Peter stood up and he began to preach. And he quoted no less than three Bible passages. And he explained them. And he basically proclaimed, Christ Jesus, crucified, resurrected, and exalted to the highest. And he encouraged the people to trust in Christ as Savior. And it's that part of the message where we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, towards the end of this, the first sermon in church history. It says, with many other words. And this emphasizes that what we, what we read in the text of Acts chapter 2 is merely a summary of what Peter said. He used many other word, words. And it also emphasizes that we must preach in season and out of season. 
We must use many words. We must use other words. We must use different strategies and tactics. We have to use tracks. We have to use media. We have to use skits. We have to use songs. We have to use whatever is necessary to proclaim biblical truth. And with many other words, reach our generation. And the Bible says that Peter was teaching them with many other words, and he testified. And the Koine Greek word for testify means effectively bearing witness by providing evidence. Not only testifying, but effectively providing witness by providing evidence. And why not? Peter had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. This same Peter who had, on three occasions, the night that Jesus was arrested, denied him. The Bible says that on the third such occasion, Jesus looked at him. And they connected eye to eye. Could you imagine that moment? The Bible says that Peter went out and cried bitterly. And obviously he repented. And this same Peter, a lowly fisherman who had no educational background whatsoever, who had failed Jesus, so, so majorly failed Jesus, God raises him up to testify, to provide a convincing witness of the resurrection of Jesus and of the truth of the gospel. And you and I, we've not seen the resurrected Christ. I hope at least not. I mean, we're going to see him in heaven. But Paul did clear up. And last of all, he appeared to me. So you and I have not seen the resurrected Christ. But we can testify to the fact that he is risen because of the witness of the eyewitnesses that we read about in the New Testament. Because of the confirmation of the New Testament itself. And because the grave is empty there by the hill called Golgotha. The grave is still empty to this day. We know for certain he lives. He has risen. He has conquered death. And we can testify to the transformational grace and power that he has operated in our lives, just like he transformed Peter from a failed uh, fisherman, a failed witness. He has transformed us from sinners to saints. And so we can testify about Jesus. And the Bible says that he testified and exhorted them. And the word exhorted there in the Koine Greek is a special word also. It means that he exhorted them in a persuasive manner. Very often, when we speak to unbelievers, we want to win a debate. You know, they have a different philosophy and they have different ethics, and they have a different lifestyle. And very often in speaking to unbelievers, we want to win the debate and show them we're right and they're wrong. And if we are the guardians of the truth, and we are, we have the truth. It's Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. Any search for truth will start and will end with Christ Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. All truth comes from Him and is found in Him. So we have nothing to fear. We have no debate to win. What we have to do is win souls. What we have to do is persuade men. And not just, you know, put another notch in our belts that we want an argument or a political debate or a philosophical debate. What we have to do is persuade men. 
and influence them in such a way that they surrender to Jesus. That's what Peter did. He exhorted. He didn't condemn them for being sinners. He himself was a sinner. He exhorted them. He persuaded them by saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Now, that's an interesting statement because we are so convinced that we live in the most perverse generation of all time. And it seems like every generation believes that to be true. We are the worst generation and things are getting worse and worse all the time. Can I submit to you that the generations of men have always been bad and it's hard to tell or distinguish between one or another. Today we, we complain about how homosexuality is actively proclaimed and celebrated and the Bible says it's unnatural, it's a sin. But is homosexuality more pervasive today than, say, in the Greek and Roman times? I don't think so. They celebrated. Nero was a, 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 an out homosexual who tortured Christians. And he wasn't ashamed to, to be a homosexual. Can I suggest to you, while we condemn the current generation for being cold and unbelieving, that that's always been the case with unbelievers. These signs that the modern generation is the last generation before the coming of Christ is not how perverse our current generation is, but how cold and how distant from God is the church of Jesus Christ. We have fallen to the doctrine of demons. <coughs> we are, because of itch ears, following and practicing ideas that are not found in the Word of God. Can I say just to you that the problem with the modern generation is not the unbelief of the unbelievers and the perversion of the unbelievers. That's always been the case. The problem with the modern generation is the church of Jesus Christ. That we are not on fire for Jesus seeking lost souls. <clears throat> Generations will always be bad and full of sin because man is full of sin. I mean, one of the first generations, God said to Noah, I am going to destroy them all. I am sorry that I created man. How bad were they? Amen. And yet, we condemn this generation when perhaps the problem lies within the church of Jesus Christ. That we are not doing our part. You know, Jesus said that uh, many are the fruits, but few are the laborers to go into the field. The Bible teaches that when, when we do our part, God will provide the harvest. And we have to pray to the Lord of the harvest because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And Peter, the Bible says that he stated, be saved from this perverse generation. And can I suggest to you that this is a characteristic and a trait of the church that Jesus built that we want to imitate. The church that Jesus built was a bold church. You write that down, number one. The church that Jesus built was a bold Amen. church. You know, Jesus uh, told them they would receive power from the Spirit. And Peter, he boldly proclaims the gospel to a perverse generation. He testifies and he exhorts them. And can I suggest to you that that is what we need today in the modern church. 
We need men and women of God to stand up against all the ungodly philosophies that are now filling the world and that are spreading rapidly because of the internet and other means of high communication. Today, people know more about Eastern mysticism than they ever have. And they're practicing more of that than the world has ever seen prior to us. And we need to boldly stand up and stand on Scripture and believe the Lord when He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Amen. We must boldly stand up for the truth because we are the guardians of the absolute truth. And we need to speak to this generation in many ways. Yes, we need to tell them, hey, spending the money of future generations Today is stealing from our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. We need to stop as a nation spending billions and trillions of future generations. And yes, we need to stand up to this generation and say abortion is homicide in God's eyes. And yes, we need to stand up in this generation and say homosexuality is a sin before God. He loves every homosexual. He wants to save every homosexual. But the practice of homosexuality is a sin before the eyes of the Holy God. Amen. It is not natural. And we need to stand up and say that. But more than anything else, we have got to boldly stand up and proclaim Jesus is the only way. There are no others. Jesus is the only solution for the biggest problem that humanity has. The sin problem with God. And that problem generates every other problem on earth. And we need to boldly proclaim the solution is not found within man himself. It is not the righteousness or the justice of man that can bring him to God. It is the righteousness and the justice of one man, a holy man, Christ Jesus, who died, who arose, who was exalted on high to provide salvation for us. And we need witnesses in this perverse generation who are bold enough to stand up and say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word and its encouragement to us in showing us the characteristics and the traits of the church that Jesus built. Because we want to be a church that Jesus builds. Help us to be bold in proclaiming to this perverse generation, in testifying and exhorting the people around us that they need to believe in Jesus who is the Christ. Father, we Pray for the lost around us. We think of relatives, of neighbors, of co-workers. Maybe even people that regularly come to New Testament Baptist Church. We pray for their souls. That you help us to be bold in reaching. While everyone has their heads bowed in your eyes closed. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus today and you can confess to the Father, you need more boldness. You need to be a better, more effective witness. You need to exhort with more passion and more pers persuasion the men of this generation to come to Christ. If you're a believer and you can honestly say, Lord, help me to be more bold for you in my workplace, in my home, 
with my family, with my friends, with my neighbors. If that's you, believer in Christ, would you please raise your hand wherever you are? Amen. It's about half the people here that raise their hands. If you're joining us today, and through the word, you have understood that you need a personal relationship with Jesus based on faith, and not your own merit, but based on faith, you need to relate to God through Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can forgive your sins. He's the only one that can give you the free gift of eternal life. If only you give him your faith, he will give you his righteousness. If only you give him your life, he will give you life forever. If you're among us today and you'd like to, Trust in Christ as your personal Savior for the first time. Would you stand up right now if that's you? Would you be bold enough to stand up right now wherever you are? Is there someone like that? Is there anyone? Father, thank you for the boldness that Jesus gives us in the truth of his word. Help us to abide in that truth so that we can be bold witnesses to this perverse generation. Help us to separate ourselves and testify to men, not only with our words, but with our lives, our deeds, our actions that Jesus is special, that he is holy, that his grace transforms sinners. We pray for New Testament Baptist Church that you continue to build us because we're waiting and trusting on you. We want to obey. We want to go. We want to testify. But we want to submit to the leadership of the church building. In whose name we pray and who deserves all the glory, Jesus Christ. Everyone says, Amen.